that loves you. You may be seated if you like this morning. So thankful for so much today. I think sometimes when we say, well, what, what should I be most thankful for? Well, we know what it is. You just explained it. We're not going to live a short time and be out of here for eternity. We're going to be present with the Lord. And that's so powerful and wonderful. I've been meditating a lot on the spirit of thanksgiving and what really the, the blessing is of thanksgiving. I, I think if we have, somebody call it the attitude of gratitude. How many of you know we should be thankful all the time? Well, so yeah, but I go through stuff. That doesn't stop you from being thankful. Well, yeah, well, I got this and I got that going on. People don't like me. How many know if people don't like you? There's a reason. You stood up for something and made them mad. You did right. Man, T.D. Jake said, if people leave your life, let them. <laughs> Why? Because if they hang around, they'll destroy some joy in your life. How many know everybody, everything is a blessing? Some people are a blessing. How about say everybody's a blessing? Someone they come and someone they, Amen. It's true. How many know that there are those who would mess you up if they hung out, if you yield to that? Well, I didn't think about that. We got something new to be thankful for this morning. Just want to ask you this question. Who do you think this morning was the most thankful person in the Bible? Anybody got any idea? What do you think? Well, it just depends on the circumstance. That's exactly. But listen, I'm going to just kind of take you through the thought pattern. I think that Adam was thankful because God gave him the first wife. She was the most beautiful woman in the world. She was the only woman in the world. <laughs> and even though she robbed the rib to, to come into the world, and then God taught him many things uh, that were good, and he also learned that even though God has blessed you, you can fail. I think Noah was the happiest man in his generation because God saved him out of a world of people from death. His was the only wife and children that were spared the flood. How many of you know this man had to be? Well, matter of fact, he was the most thankful of all because he's the only one there. And then it's his descendants and his children. Abraham was given the covenant to be the father of many nations. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, these three barren women, they saw God intervene in that covenant that the Lord had made. I, I love the stories, but one guy, I think, been one of my heroes for a long time. Imagining, if you will, a man named Joseph the son of Israel. Here's a man that is hated by all of his ten brothers, by all the other concubines and his mama's sister wife. How many of you know the story? I'm not going to go there right now. But after a long period of time, she is wanting a child so bad, knowing that God said that she is going to bear forth and carry the lineage so that she can have children like sand and stars. But if you notice this, she only had two children. The second one came forth as she's dying. But she had a boy named Joseph. Somebody said, well, is that significant? Yeah, he saved the world. Don't you know that after Joseph was in the pit, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like people to like me. I don't like it when people say they don't like me. I have people say, well, you know what, I just don't like that church because nobody likes me. And they leave. Well, give me a chance. If nobody else hugs you, I'll hug you. I can't do it all for all y'all, but how many know we ought to just realize God has been good to us? How many know God has been good? Well, yeah, it's not fair. How many know Jesus watched his own disciples and thousands of people he'd ministered to want to yell at him and say, crucify him because it was convenient for that moment? How many he understands being isolated? He understands being abandoned. But can you imagine after 20, 30 years, Joseph now gets all of his brothers back and his father back, and God gave him a wife and children that carried on the lineage of blessing. How many of you realize if God ever makes you a promise, you ought to be thankful all the time? I don't know how Joseph could go through the pit and hold on to his dreams. I don't know how he could be lied on by Potiphar's wife that he's a sex pervert. I don't know how he could stay all those years in prison and still serve God. You know why? Because he was thankful for the dream that he knew was going to come to pass. I've learned to be thankful for stuff that hasn't happened yet. Anybody know we need to be thankful by faith? We're having prayer this morning. I was went back to it again. We need to praise him by faith in advance. Why? You enter into his gates with thanksgiving and then into his courts with praise. If you want his presence, be thankful. Am I right? How many of you are thankful for at least two things? Two people. Somebody said, well, I'm going through depression. Somebody made a valid statement this week and said, if you're really going through a time of angst or depression or you're just feeling all bad, take time and think about ten things that are a blessing in your life. If you, By the time you get to the 10th one, you won't even remember that junk. You won't even remember all the lies. You won't remember the hurt. Because in this life, I don't want to bum you out. If you're young, you'll find it out later. But in this life, you will have trouble. Not everybody likes you. 
I thought everybody liked me. There's some people, I don't even know why they don't like me. I've been in a circumstance where I look over people, they just frown like, I did something. I don't even know you. So I smile even more. How many know we ought to try to make an impact on people's lives? I, I, I don't know. Maybe it was the leper for a moment that was cleansed, and now he's not rotting to death, and he gets to go back to his family. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's legion that was demon-possessed by 2,000 evil spirits. You think you got problems? Can you imagine 2,000 evil spirits controlling your life? And the Lord just walked by and spoke a word and oh God. And all of a sudden, that man was totally and completely delivered. Anybody think he might have been happy at least for a couple days? I'd like to be thankful for more than a, just a moment. Have you ever had somebody give you a, a sacrifice gift and you told them thank you, but you only told them twice? Wouldn't it be nice if you go around to people that blessed you and tell them every time you see them, hey, remember that time you blessed me? I still remember it. Come on, somebody say, we need to be thankful. And we think we are because I sent them a card. How many of you realize Thanksgiving is not a card? It's more than just saying words. It's letting them know I appreciate you and I love you. See, we're blessed right here in the courthouse because we are the most blessed church on the planet. Somebody ought to say amen, or I feel like I'm just tooting my own horn around here. Maybe that's how I feel about it. I wish everybody felt that way. you got to look at these times. I think probably at one time the disciples, because when the storm was about to drown them in a few minutes, the Lord just stopped the storm, and now they're thankful. I wonder how long they kept that spirit of thanksgiving. Then you realize when they got off the boat and came back to town, there was a man on his knees before the Lord. He said, my daughter's dying. Please come. And the Lord said, okay. He walks with him walks with him toward his house. But while he's on the way, a woman that's bleeding to death stopped the Lord, and the Lord said, somebody just touched me. And so he stopped to make her whole. While he's giving her her freedom from death, somebody whispers to Jairus and says, it's too late. Leave the master alone. Your daughter's dead. It's too late. And the Lord overheard that. How many of the Lord has peripheral hearing? He overheard that, and he said, no, only believe. Paul wrote a song I'm going to your house. How many of the Lord said he's going to your house? He's still going to your house, no matter what it looks like. And I love that so much because when he got to the house, all the people are already weeping, and the Lord said, y'all got to get out of here because she's not dead. She's only asleep. And they laughed him because he's the one that knew what sleep is, and he knew what death was because he's going to do both of those things but resurrect. And the Bible said that he raised her from the dead. Can you imagine how happy Jairus was when he found out he's not too late? There's a song out right now that said when he's four days late, he's still right on time. I don't know about you, but if my daughter died and she's 12 years old and God raised her up, I'd go to church for a month. Amen. Amen. How many know Thanksgiving sometimes wanes away? Don't get ugly with me right now. How many of you know I've been in prison with people saying, if God would get me out of prison in this area, I will go to church for the rest of my life. God miraculously shortened their time and brought them out, and they came to church once. And God knew they were not going to do it, but he still, come on, how many know the Lord always hears our cry? And if he blesses you for your promise, he also knows you're on your own when it comes to fulfilling that promise. God has been good to me. Can everybody say God has been good to me? I I think one of the things, there's a lot of people as we're talking about it, we'll get to the heavy one a little bit in a moment, but I think sometimes we talk about the thief that was on the cross. There's two thieves. One of them just wanted to get off. He just wanted the Lord to prove himself to him. There's a lot of people that really don't want the Lord to be the Lord of their life. They just want him to fix them. How many of you know if you don't want that doctor just to be your neighbor and to love you all the time, you just want him to cut out the cancer? How many know that's a different thing? He's hired to do that. But how many of the Lord, the Bible said, a, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a day of adversity. Am I right? But you look at this time and this circumstance, and when we look at the Word of God and the way that we sometimes ought to dig a little bit deeper, there's a man hanging there beside the Lord, thinking that the Lord must have done something wrong because anybody that is on the, a cross is cursed. They say every man that hangs on a tree, he's cursed. And here's a man that doesn't know all about it. He may have heard about the Lord's miracles. He may have heard about resurrection of Lazarus. We don't know all that. Or maybe he's a newbie. But you got to understand something about the Lord. He knew that he is praying for his haters. He's praying for those that are nailing him and praying for those that are killing him. And he got in his heart something about that man. And he said, Lord, when you get into your kingdom, just remember me. Notice this. He didn't pray the prayer of faith. 
as far as salvation. He didn't say, oh, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. He didn't say, I believe that you're going to die. In a few days, you're going to get up. He didn't know all that. He had never given tithe or offering. He'd never gone on a missions trip. He'd never done anything. But he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. You know what the Lord told him back? Hey, you and I are going to be in paradise today. I don't know about you, but I think if I was him and I knew I had a few minutes to live and the Lord just saved me from eternal damnation and brought the gift of it, and he said, you're getting ready to go to my house with me and we're going to be forever, I think that man might have been, I think he was happy until he died. There's times I've been very ashamed that I lost my spirit of thanksgiving too soon. Anybody admit that? I stopped being thankful too fast. The next time you ask the Lord to forgive you, and he does, take a little bit longer to mess up again. Amen. Oh, I'm so sorry. If we're really sorry after a while, we're going to have to stop causing things that make us sorry. Amen. Just look at your neighbor one time and tell him, I'm sorry again. (laughs) Nobody did that except two, so. How many of you in this life have been hurt by people that you needed? How many of you have had restoration of relationships with people that you really wanted them back? Don't ever stop being thankful. Amen? Say it. I'll never stop being thankful. I, I, I can't even imagine all of it, but if you'll go with me to Psalm 50, 51, some of you already in your mind have probably in your imagination sort of where we're going with this because David is the greatest king of all. We deal with him a lot because he's the greatest king. Still considered the greatest and out of his lineage, he was able to bring forth the Messiah and the spiritual side. Can't even imagine that God would say to me, out of your children is going to come forth and come forth and come forth until the Messiah has come through your lineage. What favor that is. What an honor that is. But most of us know the story in some level about David after he had killed the giant and saved his kingdom from being Uh, in slavery by the Gathites, the the people of Goliath. He saved the nation from being slaves. He also killed the giant with a slingshot. He did all that, and many times was a blessing. When the troubling spirit would come to Saul, his king, he would have to come and play his harp, and the spirit of the Lord would come upon the music, and the music would drive that spirit away from him, and he would have peace in his mind. And even though we recognize that David had to endure the hate of his own father-in-law and his king, Because of jealousy. I'm going to deal with jealousy sometime soon. Because jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Jealousy doesn't make any kind of sense. Am I right? But how many know it's a feeling that can rob you of your joy? It can make you live in question and fear. It can keep you angry. Amen? But in Psalm 51, David comes to write this. I I know you know it, but let me say it. All of the scripture that is written, David usually writes about the praises to God and the victories. Then you go to the Psalms, you go to the Proverbs, you go to those things that are carried on by his family. And most of it's just glorifying God. Sometimes it's questions that lead to answers, but most of the time it's God receiving glory and honor through his life. For David to be very real, we have to take the time to realize even when he messed up, he wasn't ashamed to publicly write out what he did and that God let him repent. How many know we've all sinned? Most of all, I'm per- no, you're not. We all have come into this world speaking lies. We're all sinners, born in sin. And the only way you get rid of that is let the blood wash that away. And then you're a brand new creation, and all of that old past doesn't apply to your life anymore. So let's read this, and, and let's read it together, Psalm 51 and 1. When David sinned, he didn't just do a little sin. He did it all at once. I mean, he'd been real good. It, it's almost like David was saving up. He'd never, I mean, he killed the Philistines because they were trying to be rulers over their life. He had done those. He killed Goliath because he was going to take over the throne. But he had never just murdered anybody. He never had anybody deliberately killed out of selfishness. And he had never had an an act of adultery. Some of you don't know what adultery is. It's things adults try. Okay, we'll get that on the way home. How many know those sins can't enter the kingdom? Sexual perversion can't. Why? Can you imagine heaven with mess? So we have to cleanse that. How many know we have to cleanse it? David, as you know, was one night when he's supposed to be fighting and supposed to be winning war, 
and keeping the enemy away, he just sort of thought, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm going to rest. And he was walking on the wall in the middle of the night. He looked over the wall, and he saw a lady bathing, and he lusted for her. Some say she was in ceremonial cleansing. I accept that. But he called his dearest, closest friends and his servants and said, I want you to go get that lady and bring her to me. How many of you realize when David did that, his servants lost all confidence in him? Doesn't matter how good you shout on Sunday. How many know if you mess up like that, your people aren't going to believe in you as much? Am I right? So be honorable among your friends. And we know the story. He brought her. She had a baby by him. And when she told him, I'm going to have a baby, he found out that he was going to be caught. So he sent a messenger, long story short, and he told the captain of the army, make sure that Uriah the Hittite's in the front of the battle This woman that I have just had this affair with, I'm not going to tell you about it, but I'll tell you this, we got to make sure that her husband dies. And in war, you know, everybody dies, it's not a big deal. And so Uriah got killed, and David felt like he had covered his sin. you got to understand that David had never done this before. When you're at a place where you sin like that the first time, Something you've never done before, you're in a dilemma. How am I going to act? What am I going to do? Am I going to continue that or am I going to walk away? So the Bible said that he thought he was covered. He thought it was okay, but the child is ill. And the prophet comes to the house and he tells him the story that we all recite in some realm. The prophet said to David, you know, there's a guy in town that he's got all these animals and cows and sheep. and all, He has all this. And Next across the street, there's a man that just has one lamb. He doesn't have a wife and kids. He doesn't have family. He just has that one lamb. It's like his family. So the rich man that had all the cattle, all the animals, had a visitor one night. And instead of taking one of his lambs from the massive flock, he went to the man's house that just had one. And he took his lamb and he killed it and served dinner for his guests. By that time, smoke is coming out of David's ears. and He's pronouncing curses on that evil man. How could anybody do that? When he gets finished haranguing and screaming at this evil the man is doing, the prophet looked at him and he said, well, David, you're that man. You could have had any woman in the country. That's the law. You could have a wife as a king, but you chose to take a man's wife that only had one. And the Bible said, listen closely, David fell on his face and repented. Can I tell you that the answer for every sin you've ever committed is not making excuses. It's falling on your face before the Lord, accepting forgiveness. Look at me. He doesn't ask you to do big things and hard things. He just asks you to repent. Repentance is not how many tears you shed and how you kneel and how you do that. Repentance is doing this. I'm not following that way anymore. I'm not going that path anymore. We got some people that got on their knees and cried, but they kept walking the same path. I'm trying to help you now. How many do we have to turn around? Repentance means make a turn and never go that way again. So let's read it together. He is saying to God unashamedly, and look at me, he wrote it down. He wrote down his prayer, and he confessed completely so the other people would never say, well, you don't have to repent. You don't have to confess. This is what David said. Have mercy upon me, O God. Not according to my understanding, but according to your loving kindness. How many of you know if you know God has love and kindness to the extreme, there's something comforting in that. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, Because you're that merciful, blot out my transgression. What does blot out mean? Anybody ever white out something? This is not what we're talking about. That's covering it up. It's when you destroy it. Everybody say when it's gone completely. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash me. Everybody say wash me. Cleanse me. Why? God is the only one that can. And David knew that he could. Because he knew God. Well, then how did he do that sin? All of us know God, but we've sinned. Has anybody ever sinned since you believed? Anybody still holding on to unforgiveness? Anger. Hate. Not getting a lot of amens today, but the camera's not on you. It's okay. I acknowledge my transgression. In other words, I'm admitting I messed up. My sin is ever before me. Can you imagine what that must have meant? All of his servants now look at him and they're thinking, we thought you were all that in a bag of chips, David. We, we went and got her for you. We helped you cover it up. Can you imagine every time David looked into the eyes of Bathsheba what he felt? I know you're my wife now because you have to be. I'm king and you have to do what I say. 
Don't you know he might have seen her a few times and she's looking at him like, you killed my husband. And I had a baby by you and God took it. How many, she had to find out about mercy too. By the way David repented, his own wife found out God can forgive. That baby was taken. But God gave him another baby. Everybody say, Solomon, the wisest man of all. Your best is not behind you. Your best is yet to come. It doesn't matter how you blew it, what you did, how ugly it was, how many people it affected. God restored David completely. The Bible said the prophet came to the King David and he said, you've caused the heathen to blaspheme. They already hate God, and you're causing them to blaspheme because God's representative has failed. I want you to say it out loud with me. I represent God. Somebody's watching God through me. I better straighten up. Somebody's watching God, and they'll have eternity or not, depending on my. Come on, somebody say, time to quit, preacher. I know it, but I got a few more verses. Against the only have I sinned. I've done this thing this evil thing in your sight. You might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Some of us have heard that previously by people that failed nationally, and they prayed that same prayer. God, I send only before you. It affected other people, but how many of you know nobody contains your sin? Nobody is over your sin but God. And David said, God, I've only sinned against you. He didn't say, I sinned against Uriah. I didn't, he didn't say, I sinned against Bathsheba. But he said this, I sinned against God. How many, once you sin against God, you'll affect everybody around you? Once you sin against God, you'll destroy everything and all of your ability, your credibility. It'll also re- destroy your, your power and your authority to have influence over our lives. Everybody in this room has influence. How many of you can say it with me? I have influence. Do you know you have influence? People are watching. People are listening to you. You have influence. I watch the programming and see some of our our, our friends that are on there testifying what God has done for their life. And and they're an influence to say, God, fix me. He can fix you. How many know that's what it's all about? The Ross Collette in Detroit made a statement years ago. He was dying of cancer at about 10 years old. And God miraculously sent a, a healing spirit to him. A woman from the church came and prophesied life back to him. And as soon as she left the room, the light it was on again. He said it was like the light was going out and death was coming to me and the light of God came in my room and instantly I was totally healed and my body emaciated. He said I literally had to hold on to my pajamas. I'd lost so much weight and I ran to the mirror to take a look and see what I look like. You know what his greatest message has been for the last 50, 60 years? God did it for me. He'll do it for you. It doesn't get any better than that. Ever say God did it for me and God will do it for you. Come on, somebody say, he did it for me. If he did it for you and it's all that good, you ought to be thankful enough to tell somebody else, he did it for me, he'll do it for you. Don't tell him you're worse than I am. Just say, he did it for me, he'll do it for you. Every one of you are an influence. Come on, somebody say, you're an influence. Josh is an influence. Every time you look at him and talk to him, he's hungry. (laughs) He'll influence you to eat. (laughs) Just a thought. Well, that's a natural influence. Of course it is. But how many know he also has spiritual influence and people want to know about his God? They want to know about his Savior. And he's not ashamed to tell them of his Savior. Let's go on. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In other words, I was born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. I mean, all of us are conceived in sin. Some have made that to believe it. We don't have history, but some believe that his mother had an affair and had him. We don't have any historical record. Sounds right, but you know what? It doesn't matter where you came from. It matters who you come to and where you're going. You ought to tweet that. Are we still allowed to tweet, or is that communist? Okay. (laughs) You'll get away with that one one more time. But would you listen to this very closely? He said, my mother conceived me in sin. In other words, I've got a long line of sin going on in my family. Behold, thou did not desire, or you desire, you do desire truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I want to say it because it's very important as a pastor sometime to say it, and I want you to hear this. God wants you to know truth, not from the pulpit. He wants you to know truth from the inside. How many of you have truth on the end? 
Man, when I'm going through something all by myself, I don't have to find somebody else. I don't have to write a letter and I don't have to get on the phone. I've got truth giver on the inside. I have a savior, a forgiveness, a merciful God living on the inside. How many of you are glad you have him going home with you today? Say with he's God all the time. Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The hyssop is a very bitter weed that is a symbol of the the supper that the Jews have every year. And when they come to the Seder, it's a part of that bitterness representing the death of the Savior, the death of the Lamb. Even though they receive it only as lambs, we know that He is the one that suffered. He's the one that died. He's the one that paid for the penalty so that I can be free. I got to tell you whom the Son has made free is free indeed. And this morning, I am free. I'm a free. Say it, I'm free. I'm free. And I'm as clean before God as a snowflake on an angel's wing. I'm totally clean in his eyes. And you are too if you've accepted that gift. Nobody's better than anybody else. You're clean because of what he did. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin. Blot out all of my iniquities. Notice David is repeating, I want you to blot out all of it. I I don't even want to remember how horribly I acted. Wow. I love verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Oh, God. In other words, my father, my papa, like what Adam said, he's a good God. He's a good daddy. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. When he cleans you up, he can give you a new spirit. Look at me. That old one you started with won't work. You can't put bandages and one drop glue on that old one. Amen? It won't work. God doesn't want that old one. So David said, create within me a new. Anybody know when you're clean before the Lord? How good that feels? Wow. Can we read that again? Create in me. Develop. What he is saying is, I don't want it to be just today, but let that creation power work. Give me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Well, he realizes I had a good spirit until I messed it up, and my right spirit became wrong. It was my choice. Verse 11 is really heavy. Cast me not away from your presence. Here's the hard part. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. How many know when you blow it, sometimes you feel like the Holy Spirit's gone? No, the Holy Spirit is more right there present, ready for you to come and allow him to make you brand new. God's Spirit is never pointing a finger. He's always saying, come. Just as you are, without one plea, come. Everybody say, just as you are, come. Lord, I love this. Do not take your spirit. Can I just ask you that have been around a long time and those newcomers, what would you do if you never had God's Spirit again? That's what hell is. Mr. So Brother Young, we're going to live in fire seven times hotter. No, you'll be an ash in five seconds. How I many of this is a spiritual fire? You couldn't, your bones would be gone in the first hour. But we're talking about a flame of fire. We're talking about a fire, the torment. Can you imagine when the Lord gave the t- testimony of the, the rich man? And the man sitting outside the gate, just beggar. And the rich man is saying, oh, God, would you just send that beggar with a drop of water on his finger to cool my parched tongue? He's in hell talking. Do you get the understanding of that? We're not taking away hell. We're making it real. I mean, it's not just a fervent burning. It's a torment beyond the imagination of mine for eternity. I feel messed up when I get out of church too long. I can't imagine ever having God's Spirit taken from me. So David is begging the Lord in his prayer, and he wrote it down so we can understand restoration. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You have a right to do what you want. I deserve it. But how many of you realize Jesus didn't all pay for that? His Spirit never has to leave you. As a matter of fact, he said, I will never leave you. Who said that? The Spirit of God, the Word of God, God Himself, and the Son said, I'll never leave you, forsake you, law be with you always. <sighs> Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. No, you see, He didn't say my salvation because it's God's. 
Uphold me with thy free spirit. Restore in me the joy. Have you ever messed up and it took a while to get your joy back? Have you ever messed up and you hurt people and you tried to find a way to make it right with them? David has a clean heart. That's why he's praying this after the fact. I love it so much because he is saying, restore to me. Give me back the joy that I once had with the salvation you gave me. And and uphold me. Lift me back up with your free spirit. And when you do that, I'll teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted. What he is saying is right now, I don't have any influence. Even the heathen are cursing God because of me. But if you'll restore me, I'll be able to tell people about you again. They'll know that it's real because it's working in me. Some of you don't realize how powerful your testimony is without a word, without you say anything, just your life. Because you love him and you're thankful for what he has done. You're thankful because he has redeemed you from the curse. You're thankful because he loved you enough to give you eternal life. How many of you have been forgiven time and time and time again? And you know if you fall down tomorrow, he'll be right there to be the first one to pick you back up. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God is still the same. He has an extended hand reaching out. Before you need to call on him, he'll answer. What does that mean? He's there before you need it. He's there before you fall down to catch you before you hit the ground. But somebody said, that's the kind of God I serve. I cried to the Lord and he heard me and he helped me. Can somebody say amen right now? This is all good because this is about David, but the other morning I woke up and I was telling God how much I love him. I was telling him, you know, I go through the formula. I want you, Lord, to just know that you are my elder brother. and Holy Spirit, can just control my life. I want to bring glory to the kingdom. Since I got finished just telling him I loved him, the Lord spoke this word to me. And I, I know it, but he spoke it just to me. Don't get jealous. It's just to me. And he simply said these words. He said, son, I made you. He wanted one like me. Am I right? He made me. He knows every one of the octillion cells making in my body. Amen. He put the right amount of tears in the tear ducts. Amen. He made the heart pump so I don't have to say pump, pump, pump. He made the lungs so I don't have to say <gasps> let it out. <laughs> Suck it in. I mean, he, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God made me. Why do we think it's so strange that God can heal us or fix us when he made us? Amen? Everybody say, he made me. He wanted one like you. What are there, seven billion now on the planet? Seven or eight? Wow. God made every one of us. He used people to make them. But he wanted every one of them. And Jesus loved them enough to die for them, every one of them. Well, yeah, but they weren't even born yet. He died for the ones from Adam until the last man that'll ever be born. Because, see, we don't know him, but he knows every one of them personally. Come on, everybody say, the Lord's going to my house today. Oh, no, no, he can't go to your house. He's got to come to my house. He's going to all of our house. Because he doesn't have to get to the house. He's got me right here going with me. The Lord rides in my car, and about Tuesday, I'll let him ride in a Suburban again if they get my transmission fixed. They keep telling me there's more stuff going on. I say, God's bigger than all that. I don't want to hear it. How many glad you came today? Deliver me from blood guiltiness. I've shed blood, God. O God, thou God of my salvation, my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. In other words... All I need you to do is forgive me of what I did. Blood guilty. Guilty of slaughtering, killing a human being. Forgive me from being a murderer. That's heavy. But he knew that God would do it or he would never have cried out. Look at me. When you pray, it's not the words you say. It's the fact that you're asking him by faith. It takes faith to ask. If you didn't believe he's going to do it, you wouldn't ask. That's why you're beginning to praise him in advance and thank him in advance. Can somebody say, I have been blood guilty. I've never killed anybody. I wonder if there's anybody's influence in Jesus. Anybody's confidence in Jesus or confidence in God or confidence in church. Amen. I mean, it's very important because some people don't go to church because of people. I don't want to be that person that stands in your way. I said, that's not a good enough excuse. I know that. You know that, but they don't. 
Look at this, if you will. It's so beautiful. He said, deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, thou God of my salvation, my tongue will sing aloud of thy righteousness. He said, once you do this, I'm going to write the whole Psalms. I'm going to get Asaph and a bunch of the men. We're going to write a book, and it's going to be called the word of the Lord in song. This is what they used to sing, the scripture, because they were free just like David. Wow. I love this. He said, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. I opened my mouth a few weeks ago, and when I did, I caused a message to go to a captain of the army and caused a murder with my mouth. Everybody say, life and death is in the power of your tongue. My soul, don't say, I'm scared to death or you'll die. That doesn't work. That's not what he's saying. I've said that before, and I'm still alive. <laughs> I mean, that's one of those extreme testimonies. I'm scared to death. Well, then you didn't die, did you? It doesn't mean that, does it? But it will tear down your faith. You keep talking doubt, you'll have doubts for results. Am I understanding that right? But how many just because the slip of the tongue says something, it doesn't mean you're going to fall dead. It simply means watch what you say. And God is saying to David, if you'll get, David is saying, God, if you'll just cleanse my lips, I'll praise you from now on. I want you to get this one little part too. He said, Lord, verse 16, you desired not sacrifice else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings, sacrifices to God, or a broken spirit, a broken and a contract heart, O oh God. That's what you will not despise. What he is saying is, God, I could bring you $1,000 or $10 million because I got all the wealth of helping to build the temple, but that's not what you want. How many of you can't buy your salvation? There's some people now, and I, I get on this a while because it bothers me. People, every time there's Passover, you got to give $1,000 for Passover blood. Honey, that blood ain't going to, I don't care if you had every lamb in the world and put their blood on your door. That doesn't do anything but give you a stinky, sticky door. Everybody think you're crazy. How many understand what God is looking for is you to worship him? Want him, say it, want him and worship him. Does anybody get anything out of this? I, I love this so much. He said, you don't desire offering or money to be forgiven. You, you, if you did, I'd give it to you. But you delight not in burnt offering. The sacrifices, God, that you want are a broken spirit, a torn up heart in regret, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh, God, you'll never despise that. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion and build the walls of Jerusalem. What he is saying, as you bless me, I'll begin to bless the kingdom. How many of you want to be a part of blessing the kingdom? How many believe you are a blessing? Most well, how am I a blessing? What you do? No, because of your attitude. How many of you would like to be more thankful every day than you are? Amen. We have some new babies in the house around here. I get to see the pictures of the babies. I'm thankful. Well, they're not yours. Well, yeah, they are. We're all family. Amen. Am I right? What are you trying to say? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what it would take to get us to be thankful. Amen? Tammy is really thankful. Why? Because if you go on her page, that's all you see. I mean, every position, every tear, every smile, every open, closed eye thing. It's like, I'm sorry I post so much. I said, no, you got a right to do that. You're thankful. Amen? But here's the beautiful thing about this whole story. We can leave Thanksgiving and get up from the table from the turkey and the ham or potted meat or whatever you're having for Thanksgiving. But if it's just a meal, you didn't get it. Man, if I had, when we were young, we didn't have a lot of money. Christmas dinner, I remember we were so poor, we could get five chicken pot pies for a dollar. That's what we had for Christmas dinner. But you know why I was so thankful? Because I had my daddy and I had my mama and I had my family. Right now, you ask me what I want, I don't really care as long as I have my family. How many, when you get old, you realize what's important? It's not about the meal. How many, we'll get another meal. Am I right? I'm thankful for my family. Kathy said something a little while ago, and I thought, well, that's precious for her to say it. But I remembered being thankful not only for her in my life, and it was a miracle. Our family went to Detroit. Uh, I was going to say, don't ever go there, but you might get your wife there. Just, you know, te just tease. I'm picking on Josh. <laughs> Ten-week revival. And I didn't get to take her out for a 
hamburger till the last Saturday night. Borrowed my brother's car to take her home all the way to the big city of Dearborn. Got her in a little bit late after church and after big boy. And her mama wasn't really happy with me. Mama, hear me. She wasn't happy coming to the door in her night, you know, wondering why I brought her so late, 1030. <laughs> but God gave me a wife. No, no, no. I said God gave me a wife. And I'm more thankful now after all these, what have we been married, 20 years? <laughs> 15. Six, no, 50. One, two, three. None of that happened, happened chance. Because nobody else would have been willing to serve the Lord in that fashion. Put up what she's put up. I'm not talking about just me, but what ministry does to you. Amen? How many ministers evil? It, it really easy if it wasn't for some people. You know I'm telling the truth. Because all of us have been that people sometimes. But April the 3rd, 1972, we got married in that same church where she went. Y'all not saying amen right here. I'm very thankful still. Come on, somebody say, that's a good thing to say. No, that's right. And when that, that all took place, Kathy, I know it was hard for her because her father was an alcoholic, and it was just trouble, a lifetime of that. But she had prayed every time, would ask for a prayer request for your family. She'd write it down. You can find it in the front of her Bibles all those years. Father, God, save my daddy. A couple of years before my father-in-law passed, he walked down that same aisle at that same church where Kathy went and where we got married and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I am thankful. Everybody say thankful. And I just want you to get this because I was given by her. She gave me three perfect children. I'm not getting a lot of amens there. But I wrote this down and we realized that after... About three years later, God gave her and me, Donnie, four years later, Tom, four years later, April. And today we're all serving, still serving God in his presence. So I'm rich. Well, you shouldn't be thankful about all that. That was years ago. I'm thankful more now than it was then. Because I didn't realize the blessing until all these years. I didn't realize how blessed I am. I am more blessed. Look at me. You need to praise the Lord every day. You need to thank God every day. It wouldn't cost you anything. My mother-in-law will say, she said, people, family call, or anyone said, no, uh, you can call them. She thinks it costs to call. Remember when it used to cost to call? Anybody still have that quarter spirit in the phone booth? Before Kathy and I got married, one of the reasons I had to get married is because I ran out of quarters to call her in Detroit. I spent my whole salary going down to the laundromat in Reelsburg, Ohio, calling. Come on, somebody say amen. Now I don't even have to pick up the phone. I got it right in the house. My still brother, think that's natural stuff. No, it just shows us spiritual things. I believe we ought to do, as David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. In other words, if you're thankful, you'll bless him. If you're thankful, you'll appreciate him. If you're thankful, you'll glorify God. If you're thankful, you'll go to church once in a while. And if you're thankful, you'll lift your hands without anybody begging you. And if you're thankful, you'll pray when nobody's asking. How many know you'll read the word because you're in love with him and he's your everything? Can somebody stand to your feet together today and say, I'm thankful, O Lord. And I'm going to pray this and I'd like you to pray it with me. Father, forgive me for being slack in my praise. Because I've got to enter into your gates with thanksgiving and with praise. And I, I'm thankful this day for what you've done in my life. Yes, God, I thank you for my family. I, I thank you for my father. I thank you for my mother. I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for all the people that you've let me meet around the nations for all these years. But Father, more than anything natural, more than any relationship or friend, I'm thankful that one day I opened my heart and you became the Lord of my life. I'm thankful that you still love me. You love me more. I, I know you don't love, grow in your love because you loved me with all you had when I finally allowed you to come in. I receive you. Today, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I would be wrong if I did not open the gate for eternity for somebody. There's somebody in this room you know about him, you've heard about him, you may have pictures on the wall of Jesus. But you never have said yes to let him be controller and Lord of your life. The hardest thing in the world is to realize that some people have not let him be all that he wants to be for us. 
There's somebody in the room right now, you're struggling in your faith, you're struggling in your walk, your body is weakened, and you can't say no to your flesh. God wants to strengthen you and fill you so full of His Spirit that you can say no to all the devil's devices and no to all the things that bring premature death and no to those things that are robbing you of life, joy and peace and happiness. But if this day is the day that we celebrate a week of Thanksgiving and you'd really like to receive the Lord of Thanksgiving, the Savior. He will wash away every sin of your past. He'll wipe out everything you've done, thought, acted out. He'll do it in a moment. He'll do it completely, and it'll never be remembered again. You just have to ask Him. Would you lift your hand and say, I want you, Lord, to be the Lord of my life. I accept you to be my Savior. I, I can't fight this battle. I'm too weak. I can't say no to me, and I can't say no to others. I can't say no to circumstance, but... I just want you to live forever. I want you to have the gift of salvation. Jesus paid such a price. His own body was slaughtered. He was nailed to a cross to wash away my sin and yours. Today I thank him that I've received him and I want you to. To anybody today that hasn't made that commitment, would you lift your hand and say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. Bless you. My Savior. What will people think? They'll be so proud of you for deciding to live. You got a lot of friends, you can name them by name. My greatest friend is still Jesus. I love you, Lord. He made you, and now he wants you to come home to him. Father, you're starting some great blessings in our life. Don't let the enemy rob us from those. Don't let the enemy take away what you've given to us. Speak peace today. Speak life today. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. We all know our flesh is weak, but our spirit can be made strong. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just for a moment, let's meditate on him in thanksgiving. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring your way. But God does. He wants you to have strength for the journey. He wants you to have authority over those things that are weakening you, hindering you, trying to rob you. We claim peace. On this Thanksgiving day, I believe God's Spirit is saying it's time to get real about it. If people look at you and they don't know if you're a Christian or not, then you haven't quite made Him Lord yet. Not just your family, your friends, but the world is watching us. I speak peace and hope and life. In the name of Jesus. Just for a moment, something very sweet is taking place in this room today. Sometimes we don't need to know all the rest of the story. We don't need to know all the details. We just need to know that God cares and that He loves us. I want us to praise Him together. Sherry, I speak peace to you and I speak God's wisdom and guidance. For those that look at you as the stronghold now in your house, Just speak truth with compassion and love. Speak truth. Lead and guide. And the ones that you never thought would follow, the God that you serve can follow Him. But I'm speaking comfort to your house. There's so much loss and so much pain. But at the same time, we've got a beautiful tomorrow as we choose it, as we receive it and we accept it. I claim it in the name of Jesus and for the glory. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Spirit of God, have your way today. Bring life and hope. Thank you, Lord. Take this moment, just a moment. Amber, would you? Bertha, would two of you come just a minute? Thank you, Lord. I want to speak a little word back in your heart now. God didn't bring you this far to drop you. And the enemy is not letting you see future blessings. You're seeing present threats. God loves you so much. Good and faithful servant. It's perfect for today.
this is not your battle. Okay? A few months back, we were sharing about a message outside. We could try things, and it might blow up in our face. But when the battle is God's, He never fails. You're not trusting in your ability. You're trusting in the God that doesn't fail. Father, I ask you to work on the other end of the line today. She's had to walk, a painful walk. You poured out your spirit upon her, and we recognize you in her. And that glory cloud that she carries is her relationship with you. That's why the enemy would like to rob from her what the enemy says she'll never have. But Father, you said, greater is he that is in her than he that's in the world. More power in your life and your connection with God. He's reaching out to you and he's going to reach out through you. Father, today we bind all the bondages. I heard the shackles beginning to crack loose and I heard the chains begin to fall to the ground. But the Lord said, I have begun to work today by a word. And very soon you're going to watch as God begins to let testimonies come where there never was a testimony. And a spirit that is not ashamed begin to speak greater and louder than all the past hurts and pains and regrets. I thank you, God, because you've begun a good work today and we're thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful. We give you praise. We give you glory. We know that your word never falls to the ground and you've begun a good work. Let me say it. God has begun a good work and he will perform it until the day of the Lord, until the Lord gets glory, until the Lord is praised and honored. So I release you from the terror of your mind. and I release you from the what ifs and the maybes. And if that doesn't and if this does, the Lord is saying, give it all to me. And cast all of your care upon me because I care for you. I bind the spirits and the hindrances and the weakness and the flesh take authority over all those things Lord you didn't come to defeat us you came to give us life and life more abundantly in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus greater is he again greater is he that is in you than anything and anything and anything that is attacking your world we claim it and we call it done in Jesus name. thank you for it Lord let's give him some praise for a moment Brother, I just want to tell you this right now, that God is, He's done so much and the enemy keeps kind of trying to come around, blindsides you with threats and attacks and the what ifs. But the Lord said, I began a good work. I'll finish. And you'll look back in time and say, look what the Lord has done. You'll look back and say, He brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light. He bred, gave me bread and water every day of my life. He fed me with angel food every day. He took me from the land of bondage into the promised land. Look what the Lord has done. And the Lord said, so many are going to follow your trail. They're going to put their footprints in your footprints and find their way into the kingdom of eternal life. That's why the attack is heavy. That's why the war and the struggle is hard. Is because you're leading and guiding those that God loves so much from where they were to where he wants them to be in his presence forever. We give it that kind of praise. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Come on, say it out loud in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Sherry, touch Cassie. Cassie, about the time you get to the crescendo, you get to the place where it seems like everything is okay. Here comes another battle. I can take a handkerchief and I can wipe your eyes, but that's not what you need. I want you to hear God say to you out loud what he told me this week. I needed it. Today he's saying through lips of clay to you, I made you. I know you and I want honesty and integrity from your inward parts. And the enemy is trying to rob you of your joy. The devil is a liar. Every time he says a word to you, it's a lie. He's never told the truth. He gives us negative threats about what will be. But he has no control over what will be. The only control he has is if we yield to his hand and allow him control over tomorrow. Father, today I've said it. I'll say it twice. Your spirit said you're working on the other end of the line. 
while you're working in praise within her, you're going where she cannot do to change what she needs changed. Fixing what cannot be fixed. New creation, new beginnings, this time with integrity. This time with sincerity, not being pushed into it, but willing to do it on their own. We claim that in the name of Jesus. We claim it for the glory of God. Thank you, Father. I can make it as real as this. Look up at me a moment. If I saw one of my children suffering greatly and I had all power in the world, do you think I'd leave them where they are? See, I'm limited, Cassie. I just have words and arms to hug you. But God goes beyond that. He's working from the inside. He's going where you cannot go. I just want you to prophesy this for your future. Everything's going to be all right. Say it. God's got this. Even if I'm involved in some way, God is involved in every way. And I claim that in Jesus' name. I claim that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Touch for a moment. Okay, go on and come on up. That's okay. Come on up if you will. I like babies. Can I say something you'll understand as an old timer? You know I love you. God is going to be your strength. Father, today is a noble day because we're preparing as a nation to be thankful for stuff. I want you to let the spirit of thanksgiving that has been prayed in her and over her and around her. God, don't let her miss out on one moment of joy, one blessing, one little smile from a baby. Don't let her miss out on any of it. But let her enjoy to the full her life and all that you're willing to give to her. There's been a multitude of prayers prayed for you, and the Lord is saying, I brought you this far, but oh, your future is so beautiful. What I have planned for you is so magnificent, so it's not a strange thing that the enemy would like to rob you. Don't let him. When you've been as strong as you can and you feel weak, just be strong in God. Lean on the presence of the Lord that loves you with the perfect love. I rebuke the threats. I rebuke the attacks that have already started manifesting. Never to go any further. God, you're working right now literally on organs of the body and strengthening her, her womanhood. Strengthening her in her life right now. For the joy that is set before you. God is going to bless you. Special strength. Right influences and the greater authority to be totally in control in Jesus' name. Everybody involved in her life, past, present, and future, turn it into a testimony and bring glory in Jesus' name. You're blessed. You have his presence. How many wish you were that young right there and start all over? I didn't get one yes on that. Come on, how many know you've already been down your trails? Guard this life, okay? In the name of Jesus. Love you, love. Everybody say we're blessed today. Would everybody hold up your hand and say, I am blessed? Say it again, I am blessed. For the glory of God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, and in Jesus' name. Say this with me. I am going to have opportunities to be thankful by faith. This is not your battle. You're involved. You suffer. But it's God's battle. God's starting to fix it already. There's times in ministry I've never seen quite like this, but the Lord said three times today.
Suffering is only in the waiting time for change. And right now you're at a place where if you could do it, you'd just do it, but you can't. That's why the Lord said the battle is his. This is not like one battle. Some weeks back we shared the message out of Acts 27 about Paul being on a boat for a couple of weeks in a Euryclidon, which is a storm that hits you from every side. North, south, east, and west, it just keeps on battering. But the Lord gave a word, and he said, I will stop the storm, and no lives will be lost. You're standing in the gap for some that don't stand for themselves. You're standing in righteousness for some that righteousness is not a part of their life. You're standing in obedience for the will and the plan of God because it doesn't matter if God's plan is not being fulfilled. And God is not glorified. It's just stuff. But the Lord said, I'm taking stuff and turning it around for my glory and for your benefit. And situations and circumstances are going to bring glory and honor by name. So all I require of you is to give me praise and let me live by faith. That's why you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and then you enter into his courts with praise before you ever get to the sacrifice altar, before you ever get to his presence. It's because by faith you know that he's going to do for you whatever you're requiring of him. And we agree right now in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And for the glory of God, we call it done. Can everybody say, the ending begins right now? Come on, say it with me. I let it go. God will tie up the loose ends. I looked at you and I saw you like a tapestry, but I saw the back of the tapestry. It looked like just a bunch of hanging threads. Didn't make any sense. But the Lord said, you're getting ready to turn it around and you're going to see a beautiful picture of what he's promised. I release you to that in Jesus' name. Can we lift our hands and give God some praise for just a moment? We praise him by faith. We agree by faith. And for the glory of God, we call it done. I want to give this testimony. Most of you know Brother Leo and Sister Paula. A year ago in September, she was writing songs about the, the, the Worth It conference in Granite City, Illinois, and she got together the choir and the, all the praise leaders and different people. Phenomenal move of God was ready to take place. And she said later, she said, you know, I, wrote, I didn't know why I was writing those songs. It didn't make any, it's not what I write. But as she went through a year's battle physically, she said, those are the songs that I needed. God gave her what she needed in advance to carry her through it. Amen. And I was invited as a guest to come and preach and then pray. And I thought, I don't know if this is the right circumstance for this message. The Lord said, this is what they need. You know what the message was? We need to begin to prophesy to our circumstance in advance. How many know God knows the future? You don't need to wait till you get in the well to ask God not to let you hit the well. You need to go ahead and praise Him before you take your next step because He'll be before you if you trust Him in advance. Everybody say, the future is bright. Some old prophet said it many years ago, I see you in the future and you look much better than you look right now. You know what that means? There's a beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. How many of you believe that's true? So say this with me. God, teach me to be thankful. Let it not be in word only. But indeed, let me get up out of my bed every day giving thanks. Let me go to bed every night being thankful for what you have done and by faith what you're going to continue to do. God, I praise you because you've given us a spirit of thanksgiving. That's where you live in the praises that come forth with thanksgiving from your people. God, I ask you this week as family and friends come together over a meal or some kind of a gathering. Sweet Holy Spirit, I ask you to plant a seed of salvation in the mouth of everyone here so they can plant it in an unbeliever. Somebody going through sickness, put a seed of healing in their body. Somebody that needs the presence of the Lord, give us that word to give to them. And God, we're not going to wait until they get saved or healed or delivered. We're going to praise you by faith right now for our whole family salvation. And we're going to give you glory and honor. Would you look at your neighbor and tell him everything is going to be all right? Come on, say it out loud. Everything is going to be all right. One more time. Everything is going to be all right. They got signs around our part of town. And it says out in the front of the house, it simply a sign simply says, God's got this. I've been wanting to steal one of those signs and put it at my house, but the Lord won't let me. Say it with me. This is going to be my best week.